Thank you, brothers and sisters. We are very happy this evening to have this Theosophy Science talk here. So on behalf of International President, International Vice President, International Secretary, International Treasurer, and all the distinguished delegates, our convention officer, brothers and sisters, on behalf of you all, it is my great pleasure to welcome our first speaker on this 147th International Convention. And you know all, today's speaker is a well-known scientist and also an associate professor. Scientist who does the research. Professor is that who teaches what he has done the search. So today's speaker is both associate professor as well as a well-known scientist. He is working in the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, India. But he did his PhD at Bangalore from Indian Institute of Science and he went to Germany and Singapore for his postgraduate studies. Dr. Manu Jayaswal has many awards to his credit, which is really a creditable to know. Dr. Manu has awarded a Young Faculty Recognition Award for his excellent in teaching. He also got the award from the Institute Research and Development Award for his excellent research work. He is also an editor, rather on editorial board, as a member of the Applied Physics, Applied Physics Journal, which is published by the Institute of Physics in United Kingdom. And being an editorial board, he has contributed to many articles, especially his book titled The World According to Quantum Mechanics. How far can we go? This title itself is very interesting. And uh, what we study, one more point I would like to introduce here. Dr. Manu Jaiswal is the son of our uh, Jaiswal, who was the head of our Theosophy Science group here in Atadia. So he has inherited this philosophy from his parents. And therefore, with his determinant will to inquire deeply into the subtlest matter and with courage to proceed forward with steadfast, he has come to ask such question, how far can we go? Really, it is interesting to know from a scientist, at least he may give us direction how far we can go in this interconnected world with our own ability, with our own responsibility. That's all very apt subject he has selected. With these words, I request today's guest speaker, Dr. Manu Jaiswal, to enlighten us on this important topic which he has wanted to share with us. Thank you.
So first of all, uh, thank you, Shinde sir, for the kind introduction. And I also thank the president for inviting me here to share some of my thoughts. I'm truly humbled to be on this platform because this place, the headquarters of the Theosophical Society is where the great masters have lived and many learned people have come here and shared their views. Today I shall present something about science. Science, how far can we go? So here is an outline plan to share with you over the next one hour. We'll see what is the method behind science. And I will take something from popular news these days, the Big Bang Theory, as an illustrative example to show how science progresses. After that, we'll spend some time with matter, which is the playground of science but especially with quantum mechanics because it has a lot of philosophical ramifications. In the next part of the talk, I'll discuss what are these grand heights of truth when we go from matter to life, from life to mind, especially the visual mind, and also the problem of birth and death. What does science say about all of this? Science involves twofold things, experiments or empirical data and theoretical work. Empirical data involves reproducible experiments which can reveal facts and interrelations, whereas the theory tries to organize these facts and relations into simplified conceptual structures. Simplified need not be simple. And it also predicts the experimental outcomes. I've also added a caveat here, reproducible experiments, because occasionally there are experiments which are very hard to repeat and they are of ephemeral nature. Such data is very difficult to uh, publish or to gain acceptance by the scientific community. So in this flow chart, I have tried to show how the method of science is there one can start with certain experimental observations using your instruments. And then uh, there is a theoretical generalization based on that data. After that, the theory can make predictions. And the predictions can lead to new experimental observations. But then in the method of science, empirical data is the most important thing. If theory and experiment contradict each other, it is the theory that has to go, believing that the experiment is correct. So there are three possibilities. The theory may get validated, the theory may get refined, or it may get rejected, but if it gets rejected, there is an alternative theory which may come and explain. To give you an illustrative example, okay, I'll go to that, but before that, a very short remark, because you have a very nice giant banyan tree on campus, so in 1956, His Holiness the Dalai Lama visited here for the first time. He has come here many times, I heard about that. And he has, uh, this picture is taken underneath that banyan tree. It's available on the internet, so I took it from there. He has very interesting insight on how other philosophical traditions, different from science, what is the methodology there? Buddhism comes very close to science and the flow chart is a bit different. There are certain similarities, certain differences. And if you are interested, you should certainly read his work. Coming to science, this is the illustrative example I would like to spend over the next five, seven minutes. Uh, the Big Bang Theory and how science came to accept this theory. There is a lot of literature, philosophy, from the ancient times as to how the universe began. Uh, was it created or did it exist for all times? An important milestone with reference to scientific progress was the work of Hubble. 1929, he looked at all the data that was available and he could establish a correlation that galaxies which are further away from us 
based on the astronomical data, they are receding faster and faster, which means the universe is expanding. And over the next several decades, there were two competing theories. A steady state model due to Bondi, Gold, and Hoyle, and the Big Bang theoretical model originating from Lemet, but also uh, extended by Gamow. So they predicted different things. For instance, the steady state model, which said the universe ha has been the same for all times and all places in space. If it is expanding, more matter is getting created such that the density remains constant. Whereas Big Bang was about this very short time scale creation and then subsequent expansion of space, not expansion of matter in space like an explosion, but expansion of space itself. The, the, the steady state theory predicted uniformly distributed radio sources in the sky, whereas the Big Bang had predictions about remnant radiation when this explosion had happened and the universe started to cool, what, what is called as the cosmic microwave background. Then in the 1960s, new experimental data were taken. It was found that the radio sources were only distant. They were not uniformly distributed. And the prediction of Big Bang theory that the cosmic microwave background, the remnant radiation, was also discovered. After that, the steady state theory has been largely rejected, and the Big Bang theory has been validated. But the story doesn't end there. So there are recent experimental observations, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and the LIGO Observatory, which are extending these these studies to see whether the Big Bang theory needs to be re-looked at or does it need to be revised because many new and maybe unanticipated uh, advances are possible. While I've just tried to convey to you that science follows an objective route, but on the lighter side, intuition also plays a role because scientists are, after all, human beings. This picture shows Hoyle, Gold, and Bondi, the proponents of the steady state theory, they are watching a horror movie in 1945. A horror movie titled Dead of Night. And Hoyle said that he got the idea of steady state theory by watching this movie, where the, it begins with a certain scene and ends with the same scene. That is when it clicked to him, maybe the universe is also like that. But his theory was completely mathematical, deep in looking at data and all, but intuition also plays a role. In fact, he's also the person who coined the word Big Bang. We hear it so often. He said that in a mildly pejorative term during a BBC interview in 1949 when he was promoting his alternative steady state theory. So let's see what are the recent experiments you may have heard in the news which are happening, how this particular flowchart is now getting extended. The James Webb Space Telescope is a technological marvel. In order to get the signal from very faint sources far away in the universe, what is required is a giant telescope. Such a giant telescope cannot be fit in the space vehicles. So what was designed was something which could fold and then open up again. And that's why the James Webb Space Telescope is much larger than the Hubble telescope. And it can collect light from much larger distance. Now, looking further in space is also looking further in time. Because when we look at something, there is a time gap. Light has a finite velocity. If you look further in space, that light would have started much, much earlier. And what James Webb Space Telescope looks at is a bit different from the conventional telescopes that you may have. It looks at infrared, which is beyond the visible region, what our human senses can directly see. For instance, you may be familiar with wildlife photography, which is done with infrared cameras. This is not a real picture. It's a false color heat map. 
And because the atmosphere absorbs a lot of this infrared radiation, it is important to go to space to do these measurements. Now it can, because of the larger size, look at light which is coming from farther in space and farther in time, so it is closer to this beginning, if there was a beginning, as we believe there is a Big Bang. And it is looking at what was the structure at that time, so many years after the Big Bang, have the galaxies formed, have the stars formed, and it will shed more light on this topic. Some very exciting pictures from this telescope. The resolution has substantially increased. These are the famous pillars of creation where stars are formed and pictured with the Hubble telescope and this is pictured with the James Webb. There is much more resolution in these pictures. At the end of it, it makes us wonder how small are we in scale of the universe. In the scale of time, we occupy maybe a nanosecond if the universe was a day. In scale of space, also we are nowhere. We can only admire at this. The other experiment, I just have one slide on this, is the LIGO experiment, which uh, tries to measure gravitational waves. You can see on this slide ripples which are on the surface of water. Similar to that, there are ripples in the space-time fabric, which is Einstein's idea. And this is distorted by mass. Space-time is distorted by mass. This radiation is extremely feeble, but then it is not distorted by the presence of any stardust or other mass present. And if your conventional telescope at home or the James Webb Space Telescope are like eyes, because they look at electromagnetic radiation, whether it's visible light or infrared light, then these are like ears, completely complementing a different information. These are ears because these are gravitational waves. We cannot sense them, we cannot see them, we have no mechanism. But then there are these very sophisticated facilities. This is a, uh, the observatory which is four kilometers on one arm length, four kilometers on another arm length in an L shape. And there is this interference with the laser. It is sensitive to one thousandth the size of a nucleus. With that precision, the gravitational waves impact the laser and with such precision this can measure. So the method behind science, I just gave an illustrative example and there will be no more of Big Bang in this talk anymore. But this is not a picture of the Big Bang, this is a picture of the expanding body of scientific knowledge. All of these studies contribute somewhere and the body of scientific knowledge keeps growing. It keeps growing and this is how it stands today. The map of physics, a very beautiful picture you can find on the web by Dominic Wallman. Physics started with classical physics where you have this Newtonian, uh, Newton's laws of motion describing particles, how they move. Then there are other branches, Maxwell came and explained electromagnetism you have thermodynamics and this mysterious thing called quantum mechanics. Then there is Einstein's work made famous with the equation E is equal to mc square. That is where you have relativity. Relativity, quantum mechanics and general theory of relativity or the theory of gravitation that matter modifies the space-time. And at the interface of these three is the chasm of ignorance. Three different frontier theories have come up along with data and they need to be unified into one single theory and a lot of research is going to happen in the next several decades at this interface, this triangle that is formed here. Because of its philosophical ramifications, I would spend a few slides with quantum mechanics. I was privileged to work with Ulrich Moorhoff for the revision of his book, 
where I could make small contributions, but I learned a lot. So these are a few slides uh, from his work. And what quantum mechanics tells us, very importantly, is there are fundamental limits to our description of nature. Now, since the time of ancient Greeks, it was believed that nature can be described. We can understand nature. What quantum mechanics shows us is there are limits to our understanding, not coming from our method of probing nature. These are not limits from science, but these are fundamental limits which are property of nature. One example is you consider a single electron or a single proton. One may ask, what is the size of such an object? And no one really knows how small it is. It is limited by the beam which comes and scatters off the size of that beam, the wavelength of that beam. So how come something which is point-like comes to occupy space? And it is this fundamental uncertainty in the words of Ulrich Moorhoff, which fluffs out matter. Matter which is composed of <coughs> point-like particles comes to occupy space. And this occupation of space is depicted here with this probability distributions. The electrons are not going in orbits around the nucleus. But the electron is like a cloud. It may be here or it may be there and there is a probability distribution. Not only this probability distribution is a theoretical idea, but one can also image it. And these are images of atoms which I have taken in my lab using this facility called as scanning tunneling microscopy. Very beautiful images. And a very interesting thing I'll share about uh, quantum tunneling because the ability to take these images depends on this property called tunneling. Now, what is tunneling and why don't we tunnel? Imagine you are a prisoner in a cell, unfortunately, and you're looking for ways to go out. So one of the things you can try is you can walk to and fro in the cell. Believe me, it works. You can walk to and fro. Each time there is a probability that you will tunnel to the other side. But the probability is extremely small. What I mean by tunnel is you will disappear from here and reappear from on the other side. The wall will be intact. Now, this interesting calculation is available in the work of uh, Greenstein and Zhejiang this article in 97, but it's also described in Ulrich's book. The time taken for this to happen is 10 raised to 10 raised to 38. So we can estimate when the prisoner will be out. And that is far, far larger than the age of the universe. Many, many orders larger than that. Essentially, it won't happen. But for, so don't try it, but for point particles, these elementary particles like electrons, this time is fairly small. This is the reason you have radioactivity within one year, something will decay out, the alpha particle will come out. And this is also the reason that we are able to image these atoms. Electrons from the tip, a metallic tip can go to the sample and the tip can see where the atoms are, they are able to go easily, where there are no atoms, it cannot go easily. This process of tunneling through a barrier. But then there is a, fundamental limit to our understanding. Quantum mechanics gives these numbers when the prisoner will go to the other side of the wall or when the uh, electron will go and tunnel across the STM tip. It does not tell us how it does that. How could a prisoner which is on this side be on the other side when there is a wall separating? Right? The mechanisms are not known. Another quantum mystery is the double slit experiment made famous by Feynman. But here is an experimental realization of his idea. Electrons carry current is something everyone knows. And if you go on reducing that current, you can have a tube 
where there is only a single electron at a time. The tube, maybe a meter long, carries only one electron at a time because the current has been reduced so much. At the end of the tube are two slits, and the electron has to make a choice which one to take. Like two doors, we have to make a choice which one to take. But then it does a strange thing. This, this single electron does not pass through one or the other slit, but propagates like a wave. And we know that because on the other side, if you keep a long duration exposure, you get an interference pattern just like you will get with a wave. Maybe with a water ripple, you will get this interference pattern on the other side. Bright and dark regions. And this has been shown experimentally. But the most profound mystery is the Bell's theorem. The last thing I'll show about quantum mechanics Related to this, Einstein said that no reasonable uh, definition of reality could be expected to permit this. And the idea is as follows. This is a toy experiment, what I'm showing here. It's called as Mermin's machine. The actual experiment has also been performed with spin singlets, but we will not go into that. We'll just stay with this toy model. There is a source, C, which produces pairs of particles. These particles have some color as a property. A property can be anything, so I've just called it color. And they have n color, one color, two color, three color, are properties of this particle, pair of particles. They fire these particles to different directions where there are detectors which will measure these particles. And these detectors have no connection or no known connection whatsoever. They are far away in space. There is no way these detectors are communicating with each other. There is a detector A and a detector B. Each of these detectors has three dial settings, one, two, three. And for these three dial settings, they correspond to three ex measurements, three experiments, which are done to measure this property of the particle. And depending on the outcome, because every measurement has to have an outcome, the outcome can be red or green. The experimenter here decides which dial setting to choose. And another experimenter there decides which dial setting to choose. They can choose one, two, or three. And then this flashes red and flashes green in response to one or the other property of the particle. The one color can be red, the two color can be green, and so on. Now, the interesting outcome from this experiment was whenever the dials were set to the same position, the detector light flashed the same color. This was at 1 and this was at 1, the light flashing at both, both places, which is representing the property of the respective particles, was the same color. But if you took across all runs, then half were red, half were green, and they were completely random. Which should be? They should be completely random because we do not know what outcome can come here. So this uh, is discussed in this very interesting article whose title is, Is the moon there when nobody looks? Right? And the question he didn't address on the moon, but it was on these particles. Like, do they have properties before they are measured? After they are measured, we know they have, there are properties. But before they are measured, before you looked at the moon, do they have properties? And the answer, well, it's there on the first line here. Observations not only disturb what is going to be measured, that is fine. We can throw a stone to see how far something is, and the object may get disturbed. But what they showed here was the observations produce the results which was a very, very shocking result. And then furthermore, the measurement in one detector, if it has been done, decides the outcome in the other detector, which is far away in space, which is called as spooky actions at a distance. The quantum physicist Born uh, made the following remark, that independence of two spatially separated objects, A and B, 
the detectors which are spatially separated is not as convincing as you think. Even though they are away in space, these particles have a common origin C. And therefore, the particles are not independent, even though they are far away in space. This happens instantaneously. Something you do to one particle, immediately the other particle is affected. And then, then I'll conclude. Of course, this leads to a lot of philosophical ramifications about connections between the observer and the observed and the nature of reality. Anybody who is not bothered by Bell's theorem has to have rocks, rocks in their head. This is what has been said about the Bell's theorem. Okay, so that's about quantum mechanics. But then I'll show you how one goes from the quantum world to everyday matter. And this is something to think about. Picture yourself like I'm standing in front of this laptop. I am a living being. This is not a living being. And we are composed of, well, respectively, I'm largely carbon. And this computer is largely silicon. But then you break it down further. What is silicon? It has protons, electrons, neutrons. What is carbon? It also has the same things. So interrelations between initially point-like particles, essentially the same particles, different interrelations create that vast diversity of matter. It creates me, it creates this laptop, it creates sand. Everything is created by these interrelations between fundamentally objects which have not many properties. There are only three, three of them here on this picture, electrons, protons, and neutrons, that's all. And then we go from these point-like entities, which have very interesting quantum mechanical properties, to matter, which is us. And essential concepts so far, whatever I have discussed, are space and time. Whether it was about the Big Bang Theory or whether it was about quantum mechanics, everything is about space and time. We'll remember this because we'll come back to this. We can extend this further point-like entities become matter, and from matter, quote unquote, but I, again I'll argue against that, emerges life. To understand the emergence of life, I'll show you the following picture. You might say, what has this to do with life? No? This ruins life. Okay. So this is a pack of cards, which has been arranged to form among the people who play or have ever played, you would know they form an ordered set. It's in a correct sequence. And anything I do to this, any shuffling is going to disturb the sequence. I go on shuffling, the sequence will get worse and worse and it will soon become completely random. And trust me, no long, how much ever time you may spend, you are not going to shuffle and get this sequence back. I'm sure everyone has that intuition. This is the way of nature. Disor nature likes disorder. In technical terms, it's called entropy. You are also familiar, if you don't play cards, you may have an office or a home, you leave it for some time, and this is what happens. Very commonly, it happens in our uh, academic institutions. The Department of Entropy is shown here. It's a fundamental property of nature. And how life is different from this? Life, bacteria, virus, or us, can maintain order by taking energy from the environment. We are ordered systems. Everything goes according to precision. There is a biological clock. Schrodinger has argued that a bunch of atomic particles cannot form life. There has to be a minimum size, and this size is the size of bacteria and virus. And there are reasons from statistical physics which go under the name of square root n law. I won't elaborate here, but if your particle size is very, very small, then the error really blows up. With that kind of error, there cannot be any laws, there cannot be any order. The moment you hit this size, Physics has shown that you can have order and you can have these complex systems which can maintain order. Many interesting questions have been asked and these are some recent studies where 
people dwell on the possibility, do bacteria have memory? I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this. Now, we don't have direct access to any consciousness other than our own. So we can only guess based on what we observe. In this experiment, they took bacterial foil and shone some light on it. After the light was shown, potassium ions came out of the bacterial cells and which was detected with some kind of a fluorescence. When they come out, there are some dyes which will respond to it. But the interesting thing was that this continued for hours in a cyclic way. These pictures might show better. This is a biofilm before any exposure. And then a certain mask is used so that some regions are exposed and some regions are not exposed. The regions which got exposed, that is where this potassium came out and looked like bl bright blue on this picture. This is the beginning, zero hours. But then this potassium has a natural fluctuation. It increases and decreases with time. And so this brightest region becomes darkest and then becomes brightest again and then darkest as if the bacteria remembered that so many hours ago, even though so much fluctuations are happening, some light was shown onto it. Maybe these are indications of how primitive memory may have formed, primitive vision would have formed, which is only sensitive to light and no light. I'll return to this map one last time. Science is capable of explaining a lot of things, and I'm sure in the decade to come, it will also uh, close this chasm of ignorance. Biology and condensed matter physics, which is shown here, at the interface of this, we are going to learn about life. So has science, is science going to settle all the questions very soon? And the trouble lies out here. This little box I didn't mention about, philosophy, there are questions which are far from being settled. These questions were raised by the ancients as to who are we, what is the mind, what about consciousness, what happens after death, and so on. And we are nowhere close to answering these questions. Can science answer these questions? How close it is? So let's have a look at this. So in my abstract, I mentioned about the grand heights of truth, and this is what I call as the grand heights of truth, two of them, mind, consciousness, who are we, and our birth and death, does anything survive? But before we go to that, these very deep questions, I've put whatever we have seen so far in this diagram, where starting from point-like entities, one goes to matter, from matter to life, and life to mind. There is a historical dichotomy which has emerged over the last few hundred years. This domain is the realm of science. These elementary particles, matter, and soon the life itself will be explained by science. Whereas the realm of philosophy is the one related to mind. And this dichotomy has been there till recent times. But then science has begun to make forays into the mental world. And soon there will be a synthesis of science and philosophy. And together, they should be able to answer many questions which have not been settled since thousands of years. I use the word life emerges from matter. And many books and articles will tell you that consciousness is an emergent property of life. So to just get the idea behind that, let's look at the following uh, two pictures, again, playing cards. Instead of a complete set of 52 cards, if you're given only two cards, an ace and a king, now they are ordered. The king is on the top, ace at the bottom. You can shuffle them once. The king goes down. Shuffle them again. The king comes to the top. So there is a tendency that the order cannot be destroyed. The act of shuffling has nothing in it which can destroy the order. Shuffle, go on shuffling, it will be the king will always be on the top half the time, or the ace will be on the top half the time. But that doesn't work with these 52 cards. So when one goes to 
bigger and bigger number of particles, starting from one or two particles, go to large number of particles, like we are composed of large number of particles, one says there are emergent properties which are not contained in the act of shuffling, which are not contained in these particles itself, not contained in the single card, not contained in the act of shuffling, because if it was, then it will also reflect here. It didn't. This new property which emerged is going from order to disorder. And because it came for large number of particles, it is called as an emergent property. In physics, we say entropy is an emergent property. Another example is you take a single atom or a single molecule, and if it moves about in empty space, we cannot assign a temperature to it. It may bounce, it may stop. If it stops, it doesn't mean the temperature is zero. If it's speeding too fast, doesn't mean the temperature is thousands of Kelvin. We give temperature a meaning only when there is a collection of particles interacting with each other, and temperature is an emergent property, as pictorially depicted here. Hotter temperatures mean they are moving much more fast in a solid, liquid, or gas. And here is the trouble with mind. Many, many hundreds of articles have been written, but this one is my favorite. This article has tried to define emergence in physics to give a precise definition. Okay. Because you are applying to so many systems, the definition has to be very precise. And they came up with this de technical definition I won't spend time on. It's a thermodynamic definition of emergence. And they point out the dangers of extending this definition beyond the realm of physics. When you try to say, life emerges from matter, and more importantly, consciousness emerges from life, then they ended up with this conclusion. You know, This idea of emergence works well in physics. This definition works very well in physics. But when they applied to life, they said the conclusion they got was, we are only approximately alive and operationally conscious. Something to be worried about, but they should be worried about, not us. And I should point out for this reason, but there are deeper reasons that I cannot uh, share here because I myself don't completely understand them. Uh, Ulrich Mohrhoff prefers the top-down scheme, which is the scheme of manifestation, not going from point-like entities to the mind and so on, but from the mind to life, matter, and then point-like entities, but doesn't go all the way down because he says that the spatio-temporal differentiation is incomplete. And in that book, uh, one finds these definitions. There can be other definitions, but I uh, like these definitions, so I've shared with you. Mind is something which can ideate, but is not aware of the source of its ideas. Does it come from me, or has it come from somewhere else? Life can execute these ideas, but cannot ideate. And matter is the sterile physical world, uh, which cannot even execute ideas. These elementary particles, uh, devoid of any beauty, devoid of any uh, ability to act. The reason mind is so difficult to probe with scientific tools is the following. Consciousness is highly private, subjective experience. Whereas fundamentally, I've explained how science progresses. Science is a third-person account. It's extremely objective in nature. That is one reason. And another reason, because you are going to have some more talks in, in the days to come, is there could be ephemeral or elusive empirical data, data which is correct, related to experiences of consciousness. S such data are also there in science, and scientific community does not accept them. But just because they are not accepted doesn't mean they are not there. Maybe our way of looking at them has to be changed. Everyone does not have experiences. Only few people may have. And they may have at certain times. So this is what I call as ephemeral or elusive data. A very interesting uh, analogy was given by Schrodinger when commenting on the mind. And he was asking the question, why do we don't find the mind in the everyday description of the universe? We find everything else. We find these particles, space, time. Where is mind? And the argument he gives 
the following analogy. This is a painting, All Saints by Durer, where the Holy Trinity is shown in the sky, and then there are blessed people shown seated next, and then below that are kings and nobility, emperors and so on. But then he pointed out that there is one person, and you can look at this and see which one person, because I was not sure I felt there were two such people, but he says there is one such person who is completely irrelevant, who doesn't even look like nobility. And he says this should be the painter. He has painted himself. So the analogy is that this painter is your mind. The mind has created this world image. And somewhere in that world image, it has also created itself. But then it's so insignificant that you almost discard it and say, where is the mind? It's not there. But this entire world picture itself is the creation of the mind. And in words, the same thing, he says the reason why our sentient, percipient and thinking ego is met nowhere within our scientific world picture can be indicated in seven words. And these are the seven words because it is itself that world picture. And these are also thoughts of Schrodinger that I'll continue with. He pointed out that there is a hermetic separation between our spheres of consciousness. We are spatially apart. My consciousness is with me. Your consciousness is with you. Yet we agree on things about the natural world. And why do we agree? So one hypothesis is that there is an external world, and then there is us, and there is a predetermined harmony in our minds, therefore we agree. But then if you think about it, the world is only given once. Where is the other world? There is this world we are perceiving. There is no other world. So Schrodinger's hypothesis was that there is a unification of minds, of unification of consciousness. And the multiplicity that we see around, the different consciousness is only apparent. In truth, there is only one, which he called the one. You know? He was much inspired by the doctrine of the Upanishads. And this is also my inspiration for the sketch. When something is the whole, then looking at any one part will not reveal the whole. I'll put some quotes here. Before we resume with science, we are slightly digressing into philosophy. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead wrote the following, Nature gets credit which in truth should be reserved for ourselves. The rose for its scent, the nightingale for his song, the sun for his radiance. The poets are entirely mistaken. Without us, there is none of this. It's our senses which perceive and the world exists where this external stimuli and our inner self meet. That is the place like a shoreline. The shoreline, is it the sand or is it the sea? It's both. Our consciousness is like the shoreline. And so this is the world of matter, space, time, energy, with life also in an extension of it. But now science is able to make forays into the mental world. One of them is the philosophical foundations of quantum mechanics, experiments like the Bell's theorem, which really make you scratch your head, but also uh, studies on uh, psychology assisted with physiology and philosophy all coming together, for which I'll show you the next example. I'll take the visual mind as an illustrative example to convey this other foray that science has made into the mental world. Again, in very simple terms, there is this electromagnetic radiation, which could be your X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, and so on. We can't see all of it. There's also radio wave, microwave, everything around us. We can see this small part called visible, and there are different wavelengths you may have come across, like red has a wavelength of 750 nanometers up to that end violet ends at 380 nanometers and so on. Wavelength has to do with the uh, 
oscillation of the electromagnetic waves. But then, uh, if you look at how color forms, the sensation of color forms in our minds, one may say yellow is a wavelength of 580 nanometer, but one can also construct, and people who do painting would know best, construct sensation of color by a combination of colors. For instance, taking red and green would give us yellow. But in physics, red plus green is not yellow in terms of wavelength. If you take the red wavelength and add the green wavelength to it, you don't get the yellow wavelength. Therefore, this yellowness is a mental experience. The wavelength belongs to physics, and they are not equal to each other. There are relations between them, and this is something we can also generalize to other sense perceptions, such as perception of depth, depth or perception of time. Those who keep pets might know that dogs have a different sense of color. They cannot see red. So these red flowers or this you know, red collar that this young dog is wearing would not appear red to it. It will appear green in color. Again, showing that sense perceptions are highly subjective. The wavelength is not subjective. The wavelength is objective. Another property of the visual mind is binocular rivalry. We all have binocular vision. That is, we see from the left eye and the right eye, those two images are taken simultaneously by our brain. They are combined into a single mental impression. We don't see two images. We see one image. And this ability is important for our depth perception. Now, you can try this experiment anytime. You can take a A4 sheet of paper and roll it up. On one end, you can put this vertical grid. Put it on your left eye. Roll up another sheet and put this horizontal grid on that eye and see together. And I just tried this before coming here. Uh, you might wonder what we would see. Will we see the grid or will we see something? Will we see only left or only right? But what you see is surprising. You see a changing perception. There is no one fixed grid that you see. The grid keeps on changing, keeps on changing. And this is like the left eye and the right eye are jostling with each other to say whose impression should be depicted. As if they were two different observers fighting with each other as to which image should be depicted. And this is called as the binocular rivalry. And one can also do binocular rivalry by taking a red light and a green light. Don't take laser because then there will be no light after you do the experiment. <laughs> okay. Okay. So red light and green light. One eye has green, the other eye has red. And the perception keeps alternating between red and green. Even though the same eye gets green, that is not changed. The same eye gets red throughout. The perception keeps changing between red and green. And we know it's a mental process because experiments have been done on Tibetan Buddhist monks. After doing a certain kind of meditation, which the paper refers to as concentration. So I do not know much about it. There are learned people in the audience that there is some one kind of meditation on compassion, another on concentration. So when these monks did meditation on concentration, they were able to hold these images, the flickering images, for much longer time. The last important thing I'll share is the Sherrington effect. And this is due to this neurophysicist and Nobel laureate, uh, Sir Charles Scott Sherrington. And he has done tremendous work. A lot of our understanding about the neurosystem is due to him. And he pointed out that there are these 137 million seeing elements in our eyes, which are conducting the voltages. Once light is incident on the retina, it is converted to voltages. They carry these voltages to somewhere in the brain. Today, we call it the primary visual cortex. They called it something else in his time. And first of all, it's a mystery. How come voltages? Or voltages are things you can display on the screen. You can power something with that. That 
create a sensation of seeing. That itself is a big mystery. How voltages transform into the uh, perception of seeing. But then there was something more that he pointed out, which I'll discuss now. The following experiment was done by him. To one eye, he sent a train of flashes as depicted here. The light is on and off, on and off, a train of flash. And also to the other eye, but there is a separator between them. Then this is called the synchronous presentation because both the lights are flashing at the same time to both the eyes. And then one can have one flash per second, but that will be discrete. You will be able to see it. One flash, it's discrete, it's flicker, but go on increasing the flash uh, frequency. At 45 flashes per second, you won't notice that flash. It will be continuous. That's why we talk about frames per second when we look at you know, camera, what's the frames per second. We don't want to see discrete images. We want to see something continuous. And then at 60, of course, it is very well continuous. So with these ideas, he looked at two situations. One where there were 30 flashes per second in a synchronous manner. Another where there were also 30 flashes per second, but with the phase difference. So when one eye gets, the other doesn't, then the other eye gets. Put together is 60. If you think both of them, I mean, we look at both the eyes together, then they are receiving 60 flashes per second. But each eye is receiving only 30. And the question he asked is, will a flicker be seen or will a continuous image be seen? Continuous light be seen? And the other possibility is that we could give, we could treat this as 60 and then also have 60 on the other side. This will definitely be continuous. Whether this will be flicker or continuous is the question he asked. And studying on different human subjects, and this experiment has also been repeated recently in 1995. There is another research article. We could show that this shows flicker. It's not equivalent to this. That is when there is an asynchronous presentation, each eye needs 60 flashes per second to see continuous light. 30 will not do the job. And the question he asked then is that if the left eye and the right eye through these, all these optic nerves reports to a common physiological center, it's like switching on one, one of these switches, then the bell or the light there should glow and here you can switch on the other one, the same thing should happen. It should not matter whether I switch them on at the same time together. I can switch on one or the other, the same effect will happen. So is there such a common physiological center? And in his words, it is that as though the right eye and the left eye images are seen by two different observers, and the minds of these two observers were combined into a single mind. And the most important sentence, the right eye and the left eye perceptions, they also are existing independently. I can close this eye. I have a perception with one eye. But they are elaborated singly. But they are combined, not physiologically, but psychically. The limits of physiology beyond which it is a psychic experience. The synthesis, he says, is a mental one in which the finite mind uses time as the synthesizer. Essentially, the mind is being said to be beyond physiology. And to give an analogy, uh, the brain is like a complex telephone exchange where you know, different scientific tools, physiology, neural networks, they point out that this is extremely complex. But what Sherrington asked is, where are the subscribers? You are only looking at the exchange. Where are the subscribers with their thoughts, their desires, their anticipations, their motives, their anxieties, their rejoicings? In short, where is the mind? This is not the mind. This is the telephone exchange. Where are the subscribers? I have a very few slides, uh, because I'm nearing the end, just about three, three or four slides, where I will conclude with this other unconquered grand height of truth. And this is about birth, death, and evolution. And in this regard, there are scientific studies, the theory of evolution, and 
there is this particular uh, mechanistic foundation which tries to use a mathematical model and say how adaptive diversification happens, you know, starting with extremely one kind of uh, phenotype, then it becomes many, many different kinds of phenotype are there after some time. They look at what are uh, e equations, they solve these equations, and the important ingredients in this process of evolution are four words, birth, death, inheritance, and mutation. Birth and death of individuals, and then inheritance, alongside there is mutation which changes and therefore there is evolution. So evolution is described as an emergent phenomena and it is based on the mechanistic dynamics of elementary particles constituting populations based on microscopic events of birth and death. The message I want to take across from here is birth and death are essential steps in the material evolution, materialistic evolution of life. And uh, my colleague at IIT Madras, Vaibhav Madhok, he works on, I've taken it from his paper. Then the question comes, can the mind survive bodily death? And Annie Besant has written on this, that heredity, the kind of thing that I was showing you in the previous slide, only explains bodies, the evolution of bodies. It throws no light on the evolution of intelligence. Now, there are many notable scientific investigations on this question, and there are also philosophical ideas such as the mind can have experiences beyond space and time, so it may not uh, succumb to death, but it may survive. And so, I can only point out some comparative philosophical literature looking at some mathematical models of evolution because there isn't really much in the scientific domain to answer that question does anything survive after an individual's death? Science is more concerned about the group of organisms and how, how things evolve as a collection. So here is something from also from Annie Besant's The Riddle of Life, quoted there. Uh, it's from uh, Rumi. I died out, out of the stone and I became a plant. I died out of the plant and I became an animal. From an animal, then a man. Why should I fear to die? When did I grow less by dying? I shall die out of the man and shall become an angel. Okay. And then there are a couple of more. Uh, Sri Aurobindo has also pointed out that birth and death are rather intermediate stages in an occult processes of life. And again, for just comparative studies and contemplation because I'm going far away from the scientific thing. But I'll just read out this last, uh, uh, my favorite lines, that death is a stair, a door, a stumbling stride. The soul must take to cross from birth to birth, a gray defeat pregnant with victory, a whip to lash us towards our deathless state. The spiritual evolution of the self, and you can compare it with the evolution of the body as it goes through birth and death. And so I conclude with this. Science is an objective, open-minded inquiry armed with logic on one hand and empirical data on the other. And it is the master of the material world, life included. But the grand heights of truth, the mental world and the crossing are yet to be scaled and probably they are very hard to be scaled. But science has made these forays into the mental world Psychology assisted with physiology and philosophy is one. Philosophical foundations of quantum mechanics is the other. But even where it is not able to make a direct foray for people who are pursuing different philosophies, it can provide you seeds for contemplative or experiential insights. Science has some result one can think about, one can meditate about that, and maybe we can have a different experience. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Manu Jayaswalji. Wonderful talk we heard today. This was not only a talk, but it is really a thought-provoking, informative, because he began with the question, how far we can go with the knowledge of science, with the knowledge of technology, with the knowledge of philosophy, 
and he never touched the religion but the philosophy takes him to that and he gave us very nice thought provoking information and i am happy to tell you our dr manu jaiswal has been appointed now as a professor not as a associate professor so he has been promoted because of this quality which he synthesizes science philosophy and bringing to us to that religion that religion of responsibility so i am thankful to you on behalf of our society and theosophy science group really very informative and uh, talk thought provoking because we study the statements of masters of the wisdom adepts who said what are these natural laws after all natural laws are the impressions of divine mind divine mind impressions of the divine mind on the matter and when dr jaiswal said us we see therefore we see the existence thank you very much on behalf of our theosophical society for giving such a and i am happy to give you on behalf of the theosophical society this uh, theosophy in 20th century and our thank you very much sir